Okay. Um, just before I start my speech, um, if you have POIs, uh, please put them in the chat. And also, um, just if anyone is watching, like my family, um, just know that these are not my personal opinions, but just um, a debate motion that I've been assigned and uh, a side that I've been assigned as well. Okay. Um, just give me one second. We agree with a lot of what PM says. We agree that gender is probably socially constructed. We also agree that it's very important to protect trans and non-binary individuals. But what they don't prove is why you're actually able to get that protection on their side of the house. Before I move on to my arguments, I just wanna make it very, very clear what we stand for in opening opposition. We think it's a couple of things. First of all, we don't necessarily need to aggressively push that gender is a social construct. We can push other policy agendas instead. And this can be contextual and dependent. So sometimes it will be gay marriage, for example, in instances where that is not legalized. Other times it could be even things like normalizing pride parades, getting more social support for the LGBT movement, even doing things like putting more women in STEM, not because gender is a social contract, but be just because that would be better for society. Notably, these are number one, also truths per opening government's own analysis. And second of all, know that there is clearly a trade-off, right? The more media attention that you put onto this narrative that gender is a social construct, the less that you get onto other um, narratives. Now, I just want to respond to some of the preemption that we get from PM, which is that we have to take an aggressive stance on either side. I think this is untrue. First of all, because a stance does not mean that you're aggressively pushing a narrative, right? So you can answer a question and say like, yes, gender is a social construct, but you don't need to consistently push that narrative. But also you can say things like, yes, we agree that it is, but there are other important issues that we also need to tackle as the LGBT movement as well. That I think all demonstrates that we're still able to get a significant amount of change and that we're still able to push some sort of solution on our side. This is specifically about gender being a social construct on their side of the house. No thank you to the POI. The final thing that I want to point out here is that trans people can still find solace and acceptance on our side of the house through a couple of mechanisms. Number one, there are still going to be communities on either side of the house that are able to assist those people, both, for example, other trans and non-binary individuals, but also allies within the LGBT movement that are able to say, you are valid, we support you, online communities, pride parades, which don't push this necessary messaging, but instead just support acceptance of all gender identities and all LGBT folks in general, I don't see why we need to aggressively push this narrative on their side of the house to get some of the acceptance benefits. In fact, my first argument right now is going to prove why that is going to damn the LGBT community to a lack of effectiveness and a lack of an ability to get policy reforms. The first thing that I want to point out here, just in terms of preemptive weighing, is that opening government is contingent on recognition actually happening. We totally agree with them that things like violence against the trans movement, for example, is very, very harmful. We just think that they make the situation worse in a couple of different ways. The first thing that I want to frame here is what aggressiveness actually looks like. We think it's a couple of things. Number one, having things like social media, a constant push of this messaging, having things like representatives on the media talking about this thing, and generally selling that gender is not real and that it is based on social constructs. Why is this going to lead to a significant amount of backlash on their side of the house? The first thing I want to point out, and this is largely conceded by opening government, is that there is a, this is a radical change from current norms. And notably, this is seen as going too far by even moderate individuals. That is because a lot of people, when they're thinking of gender and do not have things like good sex education due to a lack of resources in their community, or the fact that sex education is largely just stigmatized, think that gender is based off of biology, things like scientific factors. And it's very easy for moderates to think that way because of the ways that biology does play into sex and the fact that it's very difficult for a moderate individual to semantically differ between gender and sex, which means that they're unlikely to listen to this narrative in the very first place. Second of all, we just think that people are, um, in general, realize and accept a gender binary already. Notably, government does not change the heteronormative society that we live in, the massive amounts of sports teams that are boy and girl, the fact that we have Barbie dolls and Ken dolls, which glorify these gender binaries. We think that it's still likely that that exists to a significant extent on their side, and that you're seen as radically uprooting these very bases of society that we're told from institutions like the Bible as well. Third of all, and maybe most importantly, is that you push the idea that gender is a choice, right? When you show that it is a social construct and that you're just choosing between one gender and another gender, 
it means that people can weaponize this. They can say, you don't actually feel this way in your heart. You're not born this way to be a woman or a man or a non-binary individual, but that you're just choosing and you're just putting up a farce. And this is incredibly important, especially in the context of children. When you're aggressively pushing this narrative onto kids, it's seen as kids choosing to like rebel against society and rebel against these um, individuals. I think that there's already huge backlash against the LGBT community. You're very likely to make that worse on their side of the house. Before we move on to the final mechanism, I'll take open in government. Uh, there's enough for closing. If, if OO want to hang trans people out to dry whenever it's unpopular to support them, they're not being pragmatic, they're just being cowards. So as I said, we can still support those individuals, right? This is about, and I'll, I'll talk about this later, why we're able to get that long-term support on our side, but in the short term, we still have things like communities, for example, which you haven't engaged with. Now, the final thing I wanna point out here is that this is very unique to their side of the house because the more that you aggressively push these narratives, the harder that it is for the LGBT movement to actually defend themselves from things like, for example, right-wing individuals. We think that radicals typically take things that are somewhat present and push it even further, right? So they say the whole LGBT community is supporting this thing. At least on our side, if it's just maybe one question that you answer, you can defend yourself. You can say you're misrepresenting the community, that this isn't all that we're about. But now it is reality because you are aggressively promoting, giving um, giving basically a, a concrete form to the notion that the LGBT community is taking away our children and radically uprooting society. Now, what are the implications of this argument? As I pointed out, this is likely to be a tipping point, just given the fact that this is such a large degree of backlash, we think that you're um, likely to get a couple of consequences. Number one, other populations within the LGBT community, you create a third party harm onto them. What about gay and lesbian people who the community as a whole is tainted now and you're not able to get the reforms for their side? These people are also important in this debate. Second of all, you get less moderate supporting the LGBT movement politically. So not just like right wing individuals, but also more likely to vote against political backsliding like we see in places like Florida, being more apathetic towards SCOTUS and Supreme Court regulations against it. Or in the worst cases, opening government points out things like violence. Third of all, a perception is likely to be formed through short and quick and sensational messaging that exists on their side. Given that people have short attention spans, have limited time to spend on things like social media, it's not going to be a nuanced narrative, but it's one where you disagree with the entire movement as a whole and aren't able to accept them just based on the fact that you think that they're going too far. On our side of the house, you're likely to get more changes. Number one, you're seen as less extreme. As I pointed out, we can, you know, we can diversify this among different contexts, right? Their narrative is a lot less likely to be effective in a place like, for example, a very religious community, whereas on our side, we can diversify it, say things like God made you this way, and that's very important to defend things like gay marriage. But it's also about moderates, right? It's not just right-wing extremists, but we think that you're more likely to get their foot in the door to actually accept the LGBT community. We think that afterwards you can present these radical ideas, but not as a starting point on their side of the house. Very proud to oppose. Thank you very much for that fine speech. And now I would like to call upon the Deputy Prime Minister here, here. All right, can you see and hear me? Yes, I can see you and hear you. Sorry, it's setting up my timeline. I will first of all like to point out that there is no clear comparative which opening opposition seeks to support. All of the alternatives seem to be all over the place, saying things like pride marches, gay parades, etc., with zero analysis as to how they're able to achieve the very same impacts which we point which we point out to. I think the thing which was sorely missed in Dylan's speech, especially in response from leader of opposition, was that this narrative in itself is a core and fundamental belief, which is different from all the other alternatives which they mentioned. But secondly, that it is a unifying one. Ch check your notes. Check how he shows you how it helps different specific groups uh, under the LGBT movement. The, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the transgender people, the, uh, the women, uh, women within that movement who necessarily can't bring a level of solidarity those without a uh, gender ascription and how they're able to consolidate all of these guys. I think that in itself on mass gives us massive impacts and benefits, especially in being able to show support and solidarity. But secondly, on support and solidarity, it is very key to note that if you have a movement 
which seems to be lukewarm in the way in which they defend you, you are less likely to want to put your trust in them. If you have a movement that is more likely to back off anytime they face questioning, you are less likely to put your trust in them. Imagine being persecuted by the church and the LGBT movement says that they want to be able to have an in with the church before they do so. And, and notice how silly this argument sounds. Because even if you get your foot in through the door, you would at a point need to say the truth, need to say the real thing. And we think that it's still going to come at a contention and bring all of the harms which they necessarily need to point to. I don't think they do a very good job um, within this debate. The third thing I also want to talk about is that given that this is a core belief and, and given that this is very fundamental to the movements, just as Dylan said, this is a question that you're going to be asked. This is a question that's going to be posed to you, which means that the discourse is still likely to happen anyway. How is it likely to happen in their world? Given that this is sorely important for people like conservatives and religious movements, they are most likely going to dominate the discussion. The plan you're going to have is that you have no voice from the LGBT movement seeking to defend and support this. And note this, that this discussion itself, by the very characterization which they give you of these religious groups and conservatives, is likely to be polarized and likely to be sensitive, right? Which means that without an aggressive response, you are more likely to be dominated within these discussions. Why is this important? Because when you look at political debates on your TV, when you look at the posture of the people defending those points, when you even look at me defending this point, it is the confidence, it, it, it is the vigor, it is the aggression which I bring to the debate, which appeals to a massive number of people. People. at least you are a judge and you are trained in those things for the average individual it is how are these people imposing themselves onto these things and i'm going to analyze why they, they have the truth on their side and therefore they have the ability to do this but i think one the, the impacts are massive one the pictorial evidence that you you i i do have the capacity and, uh, uh, to be able to do this but secondly the fact that it is aggressive then means that i'm more likely to be given media time i'm more likely to be put up against most of these individuals and i can trust that once we have the ability to go toe to toe against them given that bigotry in itself is unfounded not in logic but in emotive uh, in emotive responses we are more likely to be able to beat them at these debates and i think that in itself spells like a good impact for us but then let me go into the change and impact in itself specifically i think one this being truth in itself creates the safest haven for most of these individuals because and i think the biggest response you get to this is the claim of backlash i think backlash is like the first thing we preempted in prep and i don't think it works within this debate first of all i don't understand how there's backlash or, or where the tipping point is with regards to this narrative when it is a narrative that people already believe that you do have it is something that they already question you with where your very identity is being questioned there is no way in which they are going to like you whether you take uh, one stance or the other which means that there is literally no tipping point now comes to backlash, even if we do concede that this in itself goes up just a little bit. But the second and most important thing is that there is mainstream knowledge pool which supports most of which supports this particular notion that gender in itself is a social contract, construct, science, research other political spectrums, other countries like Indonesia who are, who are continuing to open up the gender bracket. The problem is that these guys do not have the capacity to be able to speak for the movement, which means that most likely they are si silent. For example, in science, science, scientists cannot do advocacy and therefore these knowledge continue to exist on the shelf. The only way you are able to continually drive research and continually drive political discussions is by this very aggressive nature where you continue to put it in the face of the in the eyes of the media where people now question politicians and ask them what is their views and opinions on this. That is what, what forces people to then make investments into researching these things and to being able to co uh, confirm them. I think this has massive impacts in the way in which change then does happen. This truth then is able to boil down to different members of society who I believe are very reasonable people and then can't be able to uh, 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 deal with these things. I'll take a PR from OO. Yeah, so you talk about being able to beat these conservatives. The issue is that the bigotry does seem justified and logical to average people who've been raised for years in a rigid gender binary. This is why we need to normalize. Yeah, I, I still think you, very, you have a very old conception of the world. There are a lot of fairly reasonable people like religion has been on the decline for a very, very long time. There are more people who are buying into. And, and I think this is the analysis which they are missing, which shows why they, they lose. Like if you want to tell me that 90 percent of the world right now is very religious, 
bigots then like uh, have the debates because I'm not sure how any change all your because if these guys want to do pride matches if these guys want to do gay parades these religious people are still not going to accept them anyway they're still not giving you analysis as to why the counterfactual is likely going to have that buy-in and appeal which they themselves want to talk about but let's talk about the second impact over here we think that creating this unity gives us mass uh, massive in terms of systems of support and change one you give us more members because these members feel consolidated by the very narrative the number of trans people are going to explode when they realize that they do not need a chemical procedure in order to feel the way in which they feel, which means that more people are going to come out, even if it is not to the world, but to the movement. They are going to show that level of solidarity. More members, more intersectionalism means that you have capacity on the ground protest to be able to uh, go onto the streets and to be able to spread your message, etc. Intersectionalism with the feminist movement, intersectionalism with the with male movements, which are now seeking to be able to drive a new narrative around what masculinity in itself should mean. This in itself gives us numbers to be able to create that change, including political and social, but then also is able to co-opt support, which means that you have more donors, more funding who want to associate with you. There are corporations who are already buying into most of these things without a solid stance. Most of these individuals cannot step out to be able to defend you in most of these instances. We prove that you have change. We prove safety and support. We prove that you're able to consolidate and we prove that this is the truth. And I think that's the most important thing that you should be concerned about. Thank you. Thank you for that fine speech. And now I would like to call upon the deputy leader of the position here, here. Um, all right, um, I'm going to be taking POIs audibly, um, and I'll be taking it roughly around five minutes. So again, if you asked me earlier, I will probably get like, you know, lost in my speech, um, and it will affect my performance, which I don't like, and I won't take it either. So yeah, please don't do that. I, I, you can, I'm not saying you can't, but like, I won't take it, so it won't matter. Um, cool. Um, awesome. And again, reminder, POI audibly, I'll not be taking it in chat. So do not penalize me for not taking it in chat. Cool. Um, and for the recording, again, none of these beliefs are my own. I'm just trying to portray a conception of the world and our side, because this is a debate and we do have to defend a side. And therefore, again, it is what it is. But I'm not going to be saying anything offensive. Another uh, flag, I'm going to be talking about like, you know, similar things to Dylan, which is there's like violence against LGBTQ individuals, things like this, questions of rights, et cetera. And uh, these are obviously hard topics to hear and outcomes to hear. Cool. And if so, if you need to leave, you could leave. Um, awesome. I'm gonna be starting in three, two, one. Honorable speaker, read the motion very clearly because it takes out opening government. And that is, it suggests, it's whether the LGBTQ movement should aggressively push the narrative. That is, it doesn't say whether we have to not push in our side of the house. That is to suggest we don't have to not take a stance, like for example, Dylan pushed, where we have to be essentialist or at best some kind of other variation that's maybe a little bit moderately better, like transmedicalism. But rather, what we're able to do on our side is prove that if we take this narrative aggressively and do the actions that they propose, it will lead to more backlash and harm than good. So that means when Erasmus comes up here and says that we don't have a counterfactual, we don't win, this is a false statement and you could read the Wudick manual. We could win purely on negative harms and repercussions, which my partner proves and they do very little engage. But even then we explain to you that it's better to put your counterfactual efforts in other areas because notably all those benefits they talk about they could accrue for LGBTQ individuals that are suffering from different things like a lack of rights or backsliding or everything else are things we still get on our side of the house if we expend our energy elsewhere. Thus they have to prove that there's this unique issue that we need to push this so aggressively and that this would work. I think that they do neither of those things. 
So then, what I'm going to do, I'm going to first provide thorough reputation to we hear from them. I'm going to walk through all my case because I think Erasmus did a huge disservice to my partner in trying to refute and send merely assertions thinking that we're defending the factually wrong side when we're not defending bioessentialism. We're just saying aggressively pushing this is counter to the LGBTQ movement's interest because it would lead to more harm than good. We support everything they support. That means a lot of what they said in their first seven minutes was a waste of time. So then, let's first move for their case. I think a lot of the best material they have comes out of Erasmus. The first thing that they said is that our side is not mutually exclusive, which I explained to you the burdens of this motion and why this is an infactual way of representing it. The second thing that they said is that we help different groups on their side of the house and are able to unify them, consolidate them under one message. The problem is they never proved me the reason to do this. It's unclear why not being part of the same banner of the LGBTQ plus movement is not a sufficient gardener of support and why these people are in such a, like, for example, in fighting mood right now that this is some kind of aggressive may uh, thing that solves a problem. As such, it's not clear what consolidation of all this power inside the LGBTQ matters, because notably, all their outcomes are dependent on proving the mass public, the right-wingers to make them less extreme, or the general random individual average voter to make them supportive of your policy, because notably, you need numbers and you structurally don't have them. So because of all this, I'm unclear why I can't unify them under what ways and why this is an odd problem in the first place. The second thing is that they said discourse is going to happen anyways on either side of the house, so you have to take a stance. Honorable Speaker, Alex's response is very clearly, and I don't know how to say it's much clearer. A stance is we support. We support the idea that gender is a social contract, but aggressively pushing the narrative that is you, for example, spreading this over social media, over all the accounts you have, the types of discussions and individuals that you have on widespread general media, this is what they talk about. The type of policy you try to push, for example, gender pronouns in schools or boys can dress up like girls like they want. These are the types of things that they have to push for aggressively down people's throats to the extent that we've proven to you people don't want. And I'm not saying that I don't support this. I think these are all great things. I think we should have this everywhere. But unfortunately, they do little things to prove no, they didn't say anything. Erasmus's only response to our case was that, oh, you can't believe that they said no one's reasonable. You can't believe they said no one's bigots. We're not saying that. We think that most people can support LGBTQ stuff, but we're saying that the way that this distinct uniquely is going to be misappropriated is going to be something that's going to attack the fundamental core of people's beliefs such that they don't want to accept it and thus are able to taint the rest of the LGBTQ movement. Notably, their intuition is not analysis. It's just an assertion. My intuition is Donald Trump. My intuition is the United States right now where they are converging on LGBTQ plus rights and are able to use these different narratives in order to shit on them and they create more violence. These are real problems that they don't actually try to engage with. And so ultimately, we prove to you why uh, ultimately this all deals with their case. Then what is our case? Why are we beating them? Firstly, we prove mutual exclusivity and counterfactual. And that's energy and time spent on this means that you are wasting it on things that you could be using otherwise, especially if it's not going to work, which you prove it's not going to work. They had to prove solvency. But secondly, the way that's backlash happens means that you have to spend even more energy on their side of the house to do things because of the fact that it pushes you so far back in terms of having to prove things to people. So then, what was my partner's case? I'm actually going to run right through all of it. One, incentives of right-wing demagogues in capacity. They want to get elected. They want to support their views and get it projected everywhere, these religious individuals, whatever. And especially those, they want to counteract those that perpetually, quote unquote, erode their social conservative traditional base, like marriage, like sex, and everything else. And secondly, they want to focus on more, and they do this through focusing more on uh, reactionary policy that evokes emotions. They are willing to misrepresent situations and cause differences among groups to appeal to our us versus them mentality. So why does the narratives LGBTQ movement select to push matter, assuming CG tries to respond to this and to deal with OG's response. Gov might think that they could misconstrue anything, like they said, and you could do, you know, whatever else. But the narrative does matter that they aggressively push for two reasons. One, they could only misconstrue to a certain extent. The less removed it is from the messaging or its prevalence in a movement and media, the more there's ability for social movements to point out the ridiculousness of their claims as this being widespread. But secondly, most importantly, and why Erasmus's claim was completely false, as this not being a tipping point. Here's the tipping point. The less often narratives are seen, the less in contact it is with individuals in their everyday life. They don't see issues that are proximate to them as important and therefore less likely to be concerned and get outraged. The urgency is created by right-wingers that see this everywhere, that see it in their kids' feet, that see their kid now wearing like a clothes that they don't support. There will be a margin of change regardless of what type of reputation we got. PY from closing. Yeah, the right wing is going to weaponize this statement from your your side anyway. So it's important to have an aggressive mechanism so that you can actually no. respond and push back against it. 
No, you're not listening to my claim. My claim is if you aggressively push this, you're putting it everywhere. So it creates a sense of urgency because now everyone sees it everywhere. The parent that wouldn't have seen it otherwise now thinks it's an actual issue because it's on their kid's phone. Like this is this is this is ridiculous. You have to believe that there's a margin of change here and that this narrative is uniquely something that could be used for moral panic because people perceive gender and sex as the same because of semantics and because of they're not trained in gender studies, lack of resource community, and gender senseless world. People see the daily binary life, so they see this as a completely ridiculous claim that they're not willing to see when also while gender being a social construct implies choice which means they basically projected that you're making kids choose and therefore like vulnerable population children they see this as a problem so what do we get on their stuff house parents that think children are being attacked individuals think society and social decay and at the core of everything they have is being attacked you bold and right wingers average voters do not want to see how see support and, uh, and don't see as palatable and notably this thing is amplified because the narrative they're pushing is how your movements proceed because it largely occupies the mental space of individuals so now they take the whole movement as bad for, for pursuing things that are ineffective they perceive as and bad for the movement like not supporting for rights which maybe they support for but for things that they think is just stupid and doesn't make any sense which means you get more violence more pol less policy change school boards that are dominated by conservatives are going to do anti-lgbt stuff like they're doing now more violence average informed and boards are apathetic so the way is very uh, clear we can see that for those that need to hear this they're more likely to hear this than they survive like lgbt people not producing them good but the tipping points you create more violence less backlash and more backlash and you're not able to get things so likelihood you get more backsliding and everything gets worse that's what i'm proud to Pose. Thank you very much for that fine speech. And uh, now I would like to call upon the member for the government. You here? Am I audible? Yes, you already were. Okay, I'll take POIs in the chat. We think that even if opposition doesn't explicitly need to defend a world where biology is something that's rigid and that's completely determinant of your gender, they at least have to defend a world where people accept that there's some ground truth to gender. This probably looks like the status quo where the dominant stance of the LGBTQ movement is that there's some correct conception of how gender works and there's only one way to correctly categorize people. We think that in our world, this is notably going to be different because when you acknowledge that gender is a social construct, this is what the messaging actually looks like. It looks like, for example, having this very explicit messaging that says that the way that you perceive your own gender identity is probably going to have a gap from the way other people perceive you because of the fact that gender is socially conditioned. It's probably also going to include messaging that says things like, it's natural to not align with each other on what your conceptions of gender are. And this is precisely because gender isn't something that's static and fixed, but rather something that is probably going to be socially constructed. It's going to vary based on your co cultural context and so on. We think this is what we're depending on our world. Now, also, I think OO has a pretty fair criticism, which is that a lot of the claims that government is going to go for probably depend on the level of recognition that you get from people outside of the movement. We're going to engage directly with this. But first, I actually want to characterize what this counterfactual look like, because the counterfactual that they're defending is actually the status quo. They tell you in DLO that the counterfactual is going to be the movement diverting their resources and energy and time to other areas that are maybe more fruitful than just focusing on gender. I don't think this is going to be the case, given that in the status quo, we think that what, look, what it looks like right now is that gender being a construct is a huge part of the discourse. It means you, for example, have a lot of moderates who aren't really sure where to stand on this. They're kind of confused because a lot of these definitions keep changing. And in the status quo, they probably don't really, un uh, they, they just don't understand what go what's going on. I think also one thing to note is that in the status quo, the LGBTQ movement is highly fractured. This is because you have things like TERFs, for example, who maybe support cis LGBT rights, but they don't care about any of the trans or non-binary people in the movement. It looks like things like just huge amounts of people going off to form their own movements because maybe they disagree on the gender conception in one particular movement. We think that in the status quo, treating gender as objective and each movement thinking that their own conception and categorization of gender is correct is really, really harmful. So our extension on CG is going to be very simple. We're going to explain to you how we resolve conflicts in the movement in the status quo. And by allowing uh, and allowing uh, aggressive messaging about how gender is a social construct is more useful for helping the movement prioritize what goals and what issues it should actually focus on. Note, I think this is going to engage with OO because they just say, well, we don't need to aggressively push. We're going to explain to you why you have to aggressively push because we think that that aggression is necessary to overcome all of the conflict that exists in the status quo. There are so many opinions that are divergent and people are dogmatic about what they think gender looks like right now. We're going to change this. Cool. 
Here's our extension. We think that, first of all, we agree with a lot of what OG says about this coalition building that is more likely to happen because in the status quo, people are going to be excluded from the uh, movement because you have things like TERFs, for example, who are trying to push people out. But I think now the effectiveness of the movement at the point where you're aggressively lobbying for gender as a social construct is going to be really, really good because right now the clash in the movement is from this objectivity of views on genders. So you have TERFs who can't agree with other feminists or people who support LGBTQ movements, and you just can't get a lot of consensus from moderates because they feel confused about how all the definitions are changing. On our side, then, what you change is that this messaging now encourages a very pluralistic view of gender, because when you view gender as something that is socially constructed, you can say, well, maybe your conception is sort of valid or legitimate, because that's just the, a product of how you were raised and the types of uh, literature and things you were exposed to. So we think you're going to get people who are probably less dogmatic about gender and more opening to listening to it. Why does this change the status quo? Because I think in OO, they mostly just tell you that the stakeholders who don't are going to like push back and don't care about LGBTQ rights are conservatives. I want to push back against this character. We think in the status quo, it's actually, uh, we think status quos are, uh, in, uh, we think conservatives are likely going to be oppositional to LGBT movements on either side, but we want people like the moderates or people who are generally liberal, but are maybe turfs to start supporting this movement and start supporting trans and non-binary people. Why do we think social norms are changing? Number one, I think that there's just been an outpour of things like critical feminist scholarship in the 2000s, like lots of people are reading Judith Butler and recognizing that gender is probably a social construct and being exposed to these ideas early on. Second is that it's more profitable for corporations and people to just market to the vast majority of people. Because since they want to appeal to more people and to, instead of specific demographics, they're more likely to, for example, market things that are like, this can apply to any gender, this is for non-binary people and so on. Third is that I think people are just growing up with representation of different types of genders. And so they're more likely to have a fluid understanding of it because of the type of representation you see in things like new Netflix and Hulu shows and so on. Um, I will take a uh, POI from CO. Or OO. Sure. What matters more to a parent average voter, a company projecting its LGBTQ views or the fact that they think that their kids being indoctrinated, which exactly is what's going to happen with the type of narratives exist on your side of the house, only when you project it to everyone's face? Yeah, so I'll explain this real quickly. So I think the narratives that conservatives are hung up on and are really like uh, are really oppositional to are things like, for example, these debates over like gendered bathrooms, like can a woman go into a man's bathroom or like things like, for example, the explosion of pronouns. I think everything is going to get a lot worse on your side when you continue to support this narrative that gender is objective. This is because now it allows, like, for example, the conservative right to have these sensationalist headlines that are like, oh, the woke left just debuted a new gender or whatever, and to mock how ridiculous it is. On our side, though, you're not confusing people. You're not trying to align everything with a specific objective gender that the movement is trying to support and in introducing new categories. Rather, what you're saying is that the conception is not fixed. People can identify how they want to, and people are probably going to have different perceptions of gender because of the social context that they were raised in. I think this is going to be better on our side. But second is that we think there's a better prioritization of demands and issues on our side of the house. This is because we think that the LGBT movement right now, because of the reasons we said, are largely just embroiled in things like cultural wars. We think this looks like things like the bathrooms and pronouns that we alluded to. What this means is right now the focus of the movement is extremely narrow and bad. It looks like things like, for example, just disseminating these Canva infographics about how like misgendering people is a microaggression and things like that. What changes then on our side is people aren't fighting about whether like a woman can compete in one category at a sports event or about these like gender uh, gender pronouns on Instagram or something. It shifts to things that are all inclusive, that recognize that there are specific human needs that every gender needs, and that certain people are going to have less access to them because they don't identify with the dominant conception of gender. This means that the LGBT movement now knows to prioritize things like, for example, inclusive care and healthcare and whatever, and they can unite around the common goal of gender equality, which is the point of the movement, rather than getting fractured over their conceptions of gender, which they all think is completely objective and true, and they're wedded to that worldview. I think that you're going to reduce huge amounts of conflict in the status quo. Note, this is super important and outweighs OO because a lot of what the movement advocates for is just a number game. If you want to beat the conservatives or if you want to get your policies pushed through or you want to help people on the ground, this means you need people to go out to vote. You need strong coalitions and you need people like, for example, people from the feminist movement who otherwise wouldn't have joined to support your movement. And you also need uh, more people to join on board. At the point where you fracture people like trans and non-binary people from the movement, this is going to get a lot worse. People are going to get siloed and get more radicalized. But also, I want to just address a couple of things that OP tells you because they say this is that they're a prerequisite to pushing policy agendas ahead. I think that's not true, given that a lot of these policy agendas in the status quo are distorted and priorities are misplaced because of an undue emphasis on gender and everyone thinking their view is exactly correct. I think also moderate people are going to be more inclusive of this because they're going to be less, they, they realize they're evolving social norms, but they're confused about all the terminology and being up to date on exactly what's the norm. Now they'll feel like, ah, oh, just in general, gender is something fluid. We should accept that. They'll be more likely to embrace it. Proud to propose. Thank you very much for that fine speech. And now I will let